Brother Rodney. Bismillah, Iraqman, Rahim. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is indeed the servant and messenger of Allah. And in their holy names, I extend to you the nation of Islam, salutation of peace in the Arabic language of Islam alaikum. How are we today, brothers and sisters? All praises due to Allah. I would like to thank foremost Minister Louis Farrakhan for allowing me this golden opportunity to speak at this microphone that he has spoken from so many times. And I would like to thank all of those on the laboring staff that have been helping me in my development as a student minister under the tutorship of Minister Louis Farrakhan. Before the main lecturer comes on today, I would just like to bring up a few points and make a few remarks. I would like to bring to our mind that this is not a time for us to be frolicking and playing, brothers and sisters, because the enemies of our rise are not playing. This is not a time for us to be cooling out because if we take a look around America, we see that our enemies are not cooling out. Both the Bible and the Quran are books, two books that are used by the major part of the human family of the planet Earth. Is that right? Yes. And people go and dive into these books and they may find security in a moment of fear. They may find strength in some moment of weakness. They may find comfort in some sorrow. But in both books, we also find a warning. And we can't just go to the books for what we want, but we have to take everything that the books have to offer if we believe that they're revealed word of God. Is that right? Yes. So if it's a warning in there to us, then we must also heed the warning from God as it comes through the scriptures inspired by men who wrote throughout the span of time. What was written in there of a warning that we don't seem to want to come to terms with is that we should not be seeking friendship with our enemies. This is told both in the Bible and the Quran about seeking friendships with enemies. The Bible says that you can't be a friend of God and a friend of the world also. You can't ride both sides of the fence. You can't be hot and cold at the same time. Is that right? So it warns us about seeking friendships with our enemies. Now I would just like to bring up a point that probably while we were relaxing this week, while we were cooling out, because we tend to do that as black people because for some reason we think we have a luxury of time. Even though the same scripture says, work while it is yet light and seek the Lord while he may be found, we're not working and we're not seeking, but we're spending time relaxing and we're spending time cooling out. Is that right? right. So while we were relaxing or while many of us were in our homes relaxing watching Wheel of Fortune, okay? The white supremacists were on another channel and they're talking about how the white supremacists are gaining momentum here in America. Now there have been lynchings taking place still across the face of this country. They're just not reporting it on the news every day. And you can't wait for news to come to you like that. You gotta be working and you gotta be seeking if you wanna get the real news today. Now the white supremacists have grown to a stunning number of about 30,000. Certainly this is a small number relative to the rest of the population, but nevertheless the government, this United States government, this big powerful superpower is deeply concerned about this because they said, though they are only 30,000 in number, these white folks are 1,000% committed to their cause. What does that tell you? If they have 30,000 that are 1,000% committed, think of all the sympathizers that they have that we don't know about. Brothers and sisters, think about that for a minute. While we're watching the Wheel of Fortune, the government is concerned. While we're sitting at home cooling out and relaxing and watching the Wheel of Fortune, our own black leadership is suffering from a diminishing return. While we are watching the Wheel of Fortune, our own black intelligentsia is suffering from a great default. While we are watching the Wheel of Fortune, our own children are being fed drugs right up under our noses in our own community. While we are watching the Wheel of Fortune, our own youth have given massive doses of violence as an answer to the frustration that they feel in this society today. While we are watching the Wheel of Fortune, 
black people suffer from economic subterfuge at the hands of these crafty Jewish merchants. We don't produce nothing, but we're consuming everything. We wear socks, but we don't make socks. We wear shoes, but we don't make shoes. We don't produce anything, but we're consuming everything. We're doing all this, and this is all going on while we're cooling out, feeling that we have a luxury of time, brothers and sisters, watching the wheel of fortune. We're sitting there waiting to see what Vanna White is going to be wearing today. We're sitting there wondering, is my lucky number coming in? Hell, you ought to stop turning that damn wheel. We've been spinning our wheels for 430 years here in America. Start looking in the mirror of truth. Your fortune begins with you. All praise is due to Allah. We're in the wrong TV guide. That's why we're going toward the wrong program. If you want to get a TV guide, pick up a Bible or a Quran and read that TV guide and you find out what's really going on in America. And it goes far beyond what the wheel of fortune can ever show you. Your fortune don't lie in no wheel. Look in the mirror of truth. Your fortune lies with you and it begins with you. It begins with you and I beginning to put some substance in all this symbolism that we have going on here in America today. Now I found a study, since we're talking about seeking friendship, with our open enemy. And this, this article is based on a study done at the University of Michigan at the research center there. This study shows that even though some white people may consider themselves to have some black folks as friends, they don't support programs and they don't support policies that will help black people to lift themselves up. Now that's the overall thing. So the article is saying, that uh, a true friend will not stand idly by while other friends are being mistreated. See, that's a true friend. The deeply rooted bigotry that's here in America is one of the world's most explicit examples of one group in humanity to another group. So they conclude the article by saying that African Americans or black people also need to learn exactly who are their genuine friends. Association is one thing, Friendship is quite another. So they said, let's hope we will all understand the difference and move forward. Now we need a study like that to show us something, but the Honorable Boy Elijah Muhammad had warned us about this many years ago. And between the Honorable Boy Elijah Muhammad and Minister Louis Farrakhan, they've been preaching for 50 years in the wilderness of North America about seeking friendship with our open enemies and the enemies of our eyes. Now if they don't support policy that will help you and they don't support policies that will help your baby to have some kind of decent future for themselves, what kind of friend is that? With friends like that, hell, you don't need no enemies. You don't need enemies when you got friends like that, but we have an open enemy. And so we've been deceived today, my brothers and sisters, and it is because we refuse to accept freedom because freedom means responsibility. And responsibility means that we have to do God's will and not the will of this white power structure, but we have to do God's will. See, we talked last week about time and making an effective use of time, but our enemies are making a much more effective use of time if we're laying around relaxing and cooling out. Because when you're doing nothing, your enemies are working, all of that is working against you. There's no such thing as neutrality in divine work. There's no such thing as sitting back and being quiet or sitting down and doing nothing. There is no sideline in this. I hope you understand what I'm saying to you this afternoon. Now, when we talk about the will of God, just think about it for a minute. What if the prophets that we read about had decided to do their own will? What if Jesus had decided to do his own will rather than the will of the Father? What if he had decided that he was going to go his own way rather than the way that the Father had shown him. Do you think he would have been able to raise the dead? Do you think that he would have been able to heal the sick, to make the lame walk, help the blind to see, the dumb and deaf to speak and to hear? Do you think that he would have been able to do this? Of course not. Because he'd done the will of the Father, he was empowered to do this or anointed to do this. What if Moses had decided to do his will? He already had reservations about going before Pharaoh because Pharaoh was powerful in the land. But he didn't do his will, he did God's will. And so it made a difference. 
This is why in the church you hear them singing, Mary, don't you weep, Martha, don't you moan, and they say Pharaoh's army got drowned in the sea one day. That didn't come by the will of those men, but it came by the will of God. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So now they are watching on their TV screens as the plague, because believe me, God is visiting America. And we are not really watching the newspapers to see exactly what uh, is working in our favor today. So when people tell you that the plagues are on America, because you turn back to the sports page, you probably think we're lying. But you gotta read the real newspaper and stay out of the sports page. That's just like watching Wheel of Fortune. You gotta turn away from Satan's station of sport and play and tune in to God's program to find out what's really going on and where your real fortune lies. All praise is due to Allah. So now we see that the flies have broke the straw. Many of you may not have seen that in the paper, but see, you gotta be working and you gotta be seeking. I found it in the newspapers where the flies have been breaking the straw. I found it in the newspaper about the locusts spreading over whole countries, destroying their ripened grains of harvest. The Wall Street Journal reported that there were so many frogs on the west coast that it looked like the earth was moving. Look at it, brothers and sisters. The plagues are visiting this land. So as they see all of this and they see their kingdom falling, they're gagging and they're crying out because they want help, but there is no help because this is a day that cannot be averted. This is a day and this is an hour, brothers and sisters, that Allah has making himself known in the land and he's doing that through a beloved servant of his, Minister Louis Farrakhan. And this is where it's coming from today. Minister Louis Farrakhan is by far the number one black leader, not only in America, but in the world. In the world, brothers and sisters, praise be to Allah. But I would say to white America that may want to do something to harm the life of Minister Louis Farrakhan, that you will be met with a massive retaliation because there are millions of black people that will not tolerate it today. God's spirit is on the people today, and there's nothing that black leadership can do about it because our black leadership really has been transformed into a black dealership. You see, as a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I'm tired of trying to couch some diplomatic language about talking about some weak knee, back door knocking, uh, head scratching, foot shuffling, chicken hearted Negroes. We're going to start talk, calling it like we see it. I don't have no more diplomatic language for people that will stand up and repudiate a man that is the future and carving out a future for my baby. I refuse to find some diplomatic language. That's Minister Farrakhan's role because he's a diplomatic man and God has blessed him with the gift of diplomacy. But God has not blessed me with the gift of diplomacy. All praise be to Allah. to call it like I see it. So if you think of harming such a man, already you have received signs and you seem unwilling to heed to those signs. You've done nothing in the way of helping God's children, his helpless and outcast children that are here in the West, whose backs and shoulders this nation was built on. You see, when they tell us that uh, we uh, are of no count, or they want to call us jungle bunnies, just ask yourself why would someone want to sail 9,000 miles to get a jungle bunny to help him build the greatest kingdom on earth? What would you do a thing like that for? It says more about white folks than it says about us. And we're seeking friendship to a people who can't even be friends to themselves. But many of us are ignorant of the history of the Caucasian people. And we are not being racist when we talk about actual facts and history. In fact about it, because he had tainted history and colored it his way, he is more the racist than we would ever be. The definition of racism really falls on the one who is, who is able and has the ability to affect the mobilization of a whole people. What power have we shown? 
to be able to affect change and mobilize or stop a people. Hell, we haven't even moved ourselves, let alone someone else. So don't let somebody trick you into saying you are a racist in reverse because you don't want to fall into a bag like that. You see, they want to gear you towards seeking friendship with your open enemy because this is the only out they have now. They can see it, brothers and sisters, some of them even more so than we're allowing ourselves to see it because we spend too much time relaxing and cooling out. We spend less time reading and taking in information that will expand our thinking power and our ability to see farther than the sports page of the Sun-Times newspaper or turning our television to watch the Wheel of Fortune. So we have to be very careful in this hour because what we do today will determine how we will end up, brothers and sisters. What we, what we decide today will determine that. That's been put in our hands. God has given us a free will. And so what we decide will indeed determine where and what our disposition will be when God comes to distribute the great rewards and penalties of eternity. This is the hour of the judgment, and it is the hour of the resurrection. And those people who do not realize that we are in that hour, those people who fail to want to come to terms with what Minister Louis Farrakhan is telling you, then we probably need to recount and take you back down history's lane so that you can see what had happened to those people who had rejected God's truth before. Now the people during Noah's time, they thought he was a madman. And they didn't want to listen to him, the Quran says, because Noah ate just like they did, drank just like they did. He had to get up in the morning just like they did and go to bed at night just like they did. So they didn't see what was real special about him. And if they didn't see nothing special about him, they didn't see anything particularly special about what he was saying. So Noah went to build the ark. And all of them rejoiced and they were merry in the land. They were marrying and they were drinking and they were building and they were tearing down, the scripture says, all until Noah walked in the ark. But now Noah had a good heart. And he kind of, his heart kind of went out for the people. And he kind of wanted to, made you think that he wanted to open the door and let some of them in, even though they had mocked him for 40 years. But the scripture says God shut the door. See, Noah didn't have nothing to do with shutting the door. He had something to do with building the ark. All right, under God's instruction. But when it came to shutting the door and shutting those people out that had rejected him and mocked him for 40 years, Noah had nothing to do with that. In fact, Noah made a plea for his son. And what was God's reply to him? He is not your son. Even though it had come from his loins, even though biologically it had come from his loins, God told him that is not your son. Because if he's a believer in God, and his son rejects God, then that's not a son to him. God is telling us something there in the Holy Quran. He's really telling us something. Because you know we have strong biological ties. You know we're like that as black people. But let's look at it. Let's go on down. Here you got uh, Joseph. Now Joseph is thrown in the well. No open enemies did that. There was no strangers that came and, and, and threw him down the pit. But it turned out to be someone that he had grown up with. Hmm? And he was thrown into a well. And there he was left until someone came and got him and put him into slavery. But the point is that the scripture is showing us that your enemies are closer to home than you think. And we really become enemies to ourselves, brothers and sisters, because our own minds, because we drink in that television set, and they haven't designed nothing on there that can really help us and benefit us, you gotta really dig deep and stay up long hours or get up early hours and weeping hours in the night to catch something decent on the television. <laughs> and you don't get it from these regular TV stations that we're watching. So when we're drinking that in, 
what goes into a computer is what comes out. So they say garbage in, garbage out. Isn't that how they say it about the computer? So brothers and sisters, I just wanted to bring some things to mind. I could get into a long dialogue about it, and we could go on about the maladies that exist in the black community. But all praise is due to Allah, though the Honorable Boy Elijah Muhammad brought those problems and things to the surface that we were able to see him, he also brought with him a divine solution. And that divine solution calls for us to get up and to build something for ourselves. That divine solution calls for us to separate ourselves from these people that we think are friends of ours. Yes. You know, Moses prayed to Allah to bring a famine on Pharaoh's land. Yes. Now God answered the prayer. Now do you think God is stupid? Do you think God has no sense? What was Moses praying for that for? Because Moses said, if you take away Pharaoh's wealth, my people will no longer be attracted to him. Because the friendship wasn't based on nothing. The friendship wasn't based on nothing. And when he took their wealth away, hell, they got on away from it. All praise is due to Allah. And so, now that a famine is coming on America, and white folks' wealth is being taken away, It'll be real interesting to see how much of, how many of us really love them. Because my fair guess is, is that you don't really love them, you love what you think they have. But you better run to your salvation and come to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, my brothers and sisters. I'm telling you this, in this hour, do it today. All praise be to Allah. At this time in our program, we want to bring up another helper and aider to Minister Louis Farrakhan in this great day and this great effort. A man who stood with Malcolm X back in the days when the nation was first coming up and they were blighting the truth across the face of America. A man who lit up the West Coast back during the 60s. You can read about him in Elbridge Cleaver's book, Soul on Ice. You can probably find him in some other books. But he was the regional minister for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad back during the first resurrection of the nation of Islam. Would you please welcome a helper and aider to Minister Farrakhan in this hour that we are blessed to have with us in Chicago, Illinois. Let's give him a warm round of applause, Brother Abdul Allah Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his apostle. Beloved brothers and sisters, I'm thankful to Allah to see you here and to be here with you, and I thank Brother Rodney for giving you the good words of wisdom that he has given you so far, and I have to ask myself as I listen to Brother Rodney, uh, how many of you actually, actually believe that you need to do something else because boss that you're holding on to is on his way out. You know? Now I don't you know, I don't even have to get an answer from you. There's an easy way to know whether you believe that or not. You see, Islam is a religion of belief as a basis for action. And in that we're in accord with nature. All you have to do to find out what a person believes is watch how they act. Right. Don't listen to their mouth. They can make their mouth say anything. Right. Right. But you watch how they act. Right. If I get in a car with you and you're driving and you tell me, I believe in the laws, all the traffic laws. I'm a firm believer in the traffic laws. We're in a 35 mile zone, you hitting 80 then. <laughs> Running all the stoplights, every stop sign you see, I, say, I don't care what you say, I, I can tell what you believe in. <laughs> it's the same way with religion. This is why it's stupid for people to get into arguments over religion. See, don't tell me about what your denomination is or what the name of your religion is. That's, God is not looking for names, labels, denominations. He's looking for action. That's all he's interested in. And that's what you and I should be interested in, is our action. Minister Farrakhan said, if you watch anything long enough to determine the pattern of its motion, 
you'll know the law that it's operating under. Because right. everything operates under law, and all you have to do is watch its motion, and you can tell by its motion exactly what law is in action. Real law is absolute, contrary to what they taught you in college, that there's no absolutes. Nothing is absolute. I mean, there's no, nothing that is completely black and completely white. Nothing's all right and all wrong. And then once they get you like that, they can turn you on and out and in. It's all kind of freakishness because everything is relative. <laughs> situation ethics, whether or not it's ethical depends upon the situation. Ain't that what they're teaching you? <laughs> Divine law, real law, is absolute. <laughs> the law of pregnancy, absolute. <laughs> something happens, exact time passes, something else happens. They say, well, it's not absolute all the way as far as the time because, see, now my doctor, he told me it would be between here and between there. That's your doctor's problem. He ain't absolute. The law is absolute. You can't help it because he can't calculate, right? You have to look at what he's using to calculate. If you got one of them little calculators and the battery is dead, how do you expect to get the right answer? <laughs> so when the doctor tells you, well, you know, it takes nine months, so let's see, we're going to... Nine, what month? What's he using? He's using a calendar known as the Gregorian calendar, <laughs> named after Pope Gregory, who devised it, a pope of the Catholic Church. Come on, come on. Because they kept on switching days around, so he finally decided that he would just fix one calendar and say, now this is it, and this is what everybody got to live by. Because see, July didn't used to have 31 days. But when Julius Caesar got to be the emperor of Rome, and Rome was running the whole world, Julius Caesar decided they named a month after him. And he decided he wanted his month to be the longest month in the calendar. So he put 31 days in it. So after he died, and Augustus Caesar came along. So they named the next month after July, after Augustus Caesar, they named it August. Right. So August said, well, if Big Julie can have 31 days, I want 31 days. So he reached out and got him some more days. <laughs> <laughs> We got caught up in all of this chain. Poor little February. They kept robbing February. <laughs> Turned out the shortest day, shortest uh, month of the year. But it's the only one that's got some sense. Because when you look on a lunar calendar, you'll find that each month has 28 days. And all of the old civilizations go by the lunar calendar. And to show you it's a natural calendar, See, sister, if you try to gauge your menstrual cycle based on the Gregorian calendar, you stay mixed up. But you go by the lunar calendar, don't you? <laughs> now, if you want to know when the baby's going to be born, all you got to do is know the month of inception, the time, pardon me, of inception, of conception, count 192 days and make sure you're at the hospital. <laughs> There are those who say, oh, but that law is not absolute. You have premature babies. That's right. A premature baby is not a violation of the law of birth. A premature baby is bringing another law into existence. That's why during a certain time of your pregnancy, a doctor can tell you you're going to have a premature baby. He couldn't predict it if there wasn't a law governing it. All right. All right. All right. But we were on law last week. Let's get on to what we're after this week. Your belief governs your actions. That's a law. Whatever you believe, you act accordingly. Don't tell me somebody standing up with a gun pointed at your face and you saying, I don't believe you shoot it. <laughs> now you're saying that. But it's obvious that you don't believe what you're saying yourself. So now, we're back to Brother Rodney's point. was the one bringing the trouble on Pharaoh. The same God that's bringing it on America. But now, if you believe God is nothing, you're not going to do anything. If you believe God is nothing, 
you'll do nothing. See, your belief governs your actions, then most surely your deepest belief has more effect on your actions than anything else. If you believe God is a mystery, right. you'll go through your life ignorant. Right. Oh yeah. You want to see an ignorant person. You listen to a black person, because you know, I don't hear nobody else but black people say this. Two things I don't discuss. I don't discuss religion and politics. <laughs> Now that's the biggest fool you ever see in your life. The two things that have the most profound effect on their very existence are the two things they don't even want to talk about. How ignorant can you get? <laughs> if you won't seek to understand God, the creator of your very existence and everything upon which you subsist, what will you take the initiative to try to learn something about? So you'll stay ignorant the rest of your life. Well, you can't know God. Ain't no sense trying to understand God. You are a fool. F-O-O-O-O-L. <laughs> satisfied at whatever your station in life is. Because if you understood God, you would understand that God would make you want to strive. You see us get on a job, work on a job 50 years, retire. When we retire, we know what we learned the first month, and that's all. If that department closes down and they try to put us in another department, we lost. Because we don't have the initiative. If you're working at General Motors and you're doing nothing but putting on fenders, if you put on fenders for 35 years, if something happened that they asked you to put on a bumper, you lost. <laughs> Instead of taking the time, if it's your lunch hour, if it's an hour after you get off from work, to go watch the dude doing the bumper. Just in case your part closed and his part open. But no, you go, man, I, they ain't paying me to do that. <laughs> they ain't paying me to do that. <laughs> That's why when the General Motors plant started folding up in Detroit, all our friends ran to Houston, didn't they? Now they're folding up in Houston, they're trying to run somewhere else. We believe in the real God. That's right. Yes, sir. The real God who has an attribute in the Holy Quran, Rob, which means one who creates a thing and then nourishes it through stage after stage of development unto perfection. So when you believe in a God like that, you know that you're one of his creations, then you refuse to stand still because you know he didn't intend for you to stand still. Come on now. Come on. You know that if that God created you perfect, created you just as he wanted you, you'd still be wearing diapers. <laughs> Let's reason together. Let's reason. Where there is no change, there's nothing but death. When you stand still, you die. This is water. The essence of life. No life on earth can exist without water. But if you let water, which is the essence of life, stand still long enough, it becomes poison and will kill you if you drink it. All right. is due to Allah. So we get locked into a mystery God and stand still and don't know why all of the scriptures refer to us as a dead people who must be resurrected. Because we stood still so long, we're dead, and like Lazarus, we're dead and stinking. <laughs> now, who, you know, how did we get into this mystery God? See, this is an interesting thing. And in fact, who is that mystery God? All right. What is that mystery God? Where is that mystery God? And most important of all, why is that mystery God? Mm. That spook God. Don't get insulted. We know you say spirit, but if you ask what is a spook, you say a spirit, don't you? That's why they call us spooks and we start calling ourselves spooks. 
We said we believe in God and that God was a spirit, right? And we said God was our father. So your father's a spook, you're a spook, right? <laughs> they don't call white folks spook, so they don't believe in that. They teach it, but they don't believe it. They teach that for us. Spook. <laughs> now, let's look at that mystery. Some of y'all watch it. Y'all watch Columbo and all of them on TV. I do. Love Columbo. <laughs> Barnaby Jones. Oh, yeah. And, and don't mention Perry Mason. Because <laughs> I like to see mystery. The intriguing thing about a mystery is, first of all, a mystery is never a mystery to everybody. Did you ever notice that? Like if you have a murder mystery, nobody else may know the answer, but the murderer does, don't he? <laughs> Nobody knows. You ain't never seen a mystery. You and I misunderstand mystery. We think a mystery is something nobody knows. And we're quick to use that dumb phrase. Well, see, nobody knows. You don't know what nobody knows. You don't know everybody. <laughs> so somebody, don't care what, see, it's a mystery to me how a TV set works. But it obviously ain't a mystery to RCA Vixen. Ain't a victory, it ain't a, ain't a mystery to Zenith and all them boys. It ain't, it ain't even, it's child play to them, they do it every day. But it's a mystery to me because I don't know. All right. Now, you know, another thing about the mystery, let's, let's stick with TV for a minute. <laughs> If you, any of you have ever done, tried to do any fiction writing or sell any of your stories, you found that the thing that they always tell you is the storyline is incidental. It's strong character delineation that sells anything in fiction. That's why Margaret Mitchell, Gone with the Wind, an all-time bestseller, had nothing but some flaws in the facts of it. I mean, that thing had was so sloppy till they talked about it bad, but they printed it and everybody read it they made a movie, everybody saw it, and she had some historical facts twisted up that was out of this world. I mean, it was a joke to historians. According to the, to the way she wrote that book, those of you who saw the movie or whatever, you know that this woman, I think, Melanie, whatever her name was, got pregnant. And then she had the baby during the Battle of Atlanta, which was 14 months after the time that she was supposed to have got pregnant. <laughs> I mean, she had these kind of, 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 of mistakes, errors throughout the book. I mean, from cover to cover. But the book sold. And the reason the book sold was the characters were so strong. Yes. The most important thing in any writing is the characters. Mm. Now, suppose you got this mystery that you want to watch on television. Mm. The crook, you can never see him because he's invisible. <laughs> And the detective that's out to get him, you never see him because he's invisible too. How are you going to keep up with the story? I mean, that's going to be kind of hard. You're sitting up with the, the two main characters in the whole story, you can't see them. Yeah, that ain't going to hold you. You're going to change to another channel, ain't it? <laughs> well, I don't know. That's why a lot of people are changing to another channel. Because here we've been in a religion, reading a book that tells us that the two main characters, the good guys named God and the bad guys named Devil, but you can't see neither one of them because they're both spirits. I mean, the devil raising a lot of hell to be a spirit. <laughs> All right. Now, another thing. Keep watching mysteries. We keep watching mysteries and reading mysteries because we like the way they solve them at the end. Now, if they start showing a mystery series and leave them hanging, we start watching them. That's right. All mysteries have to be solved at the end. That's why in the 10th chapter of Revelations in the Bible, your Bible, go home and check it. I didn't write it. In the 7th verse, it says, and I quote, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, 
the mystery of God should be finished. See that? At some point, the mystery's supposed to be through. And you and I are going to say, oh, God always been a mystery, always has been a mystery, always with that. Ain't what the Bible says. The Bible gives a time limit to that. So just like all the rest of the mysteries, that's what they call a denouement. But you figure out who did it. You catch the crook, you get rid of him. And they live happily ever after. Said the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. That means we need to study the words of the prophets a little closer and we'll see that every prophet God sent, he always told them that a time would come when he would be making himself known to everybody. You know, you don't have to go too far to understand the problems that we've been having. You just get a good dictionary, great big unabridged dictionary, and look up the word mystery. You see it comes from the Latin word mysterium, which came from the Greek word mysterion. You know what the word means? <laughs> the secret worship of a deity. What do it mean? The word mystery comes from a Greek word, which means the secret worship of a deity, a god. That's how the word originated. In people hiding a secret worship of God. Here are some of the definitions of mystery. Something unexplained. See? Doesn't say it can't be explained. It says it's unexplained. Come on. To be unexplained, that means somebody has to have the capability to explain it, but is not doing it. Right. Unknown. Doesn't say by everybody. Or kept secret. Not secret by accident, because ain't nobody secret. That means somebody purposely is making sure that you don't find out about it. <laughs> Obscurity or secret. Listen to this. Secret rites or doctrines known only to a small esoteric group. <laughs> and when you look up obscure, it's from the Latin word, uh, word obscurus, meaning dark, dusky, indistinct. It means dark, destitute of light, dim, gloomy, not clear or distinct. Not easily understood, hidden. And esoteric, from the Greek esoterical, from another Greek word, esoteros, means inner. Taught only to a select number and not intended for the general body of disciples. Oh, that's your mystery God. All you gotta do is pick up a Webster dictionary and you learn that much about your mystery God. Now, who made this great decision? And why was this great decision made to hide the truth of God? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that that decision was made 66 trillion years ago to hide the truth of God from the general population. That's 66 trillion years ago. Some men decided, brothers and sisters, and, and you know, if any of you are hung up on that human beings being only 6,000 years old, I just read an article in a magazine day before yesterday said we've been fighting roaches for 350 million years. <laughs> so my God created everything 6,000 years ago. A roach been here long than that. No wonder they're so hard to get rid of. In fact, that's what the article was about. They got longevity check. You don't just get rid of them too easy. You know, in the, in the New Testament, Paul is saying to the believers, he said, you know, I happen to be passing by. I observed your devotion. I watched you worship. And I saw inscribed on your altar, one of your altars, to the unknown God. Paul said, him who you ignorantly worship, him do I represent to you. Take that. See some people worshiping an unknown God. He said they're ignorant. He know he ain't, worried. he ain't trying to represent nothing to them. That's right. Unknown God. How can you represent something you don't know? <laughs> oh, brothers and sisters, all it takes is just a little reason. But let's get to it. How can you talk about people worshiping an unknown God now? 
If God is unknown, how can you worship him? How do you know if you're pleasing him in your worship? If you don't know him, you don't know what he likes. If you don't know what he likes, you don't know what it takes to please him. You could be insulting God in the name of worship. Praise is due to Allah. Why would a father, just use your own common sense, why would a father not want to be known by his children? Why not? I mean, the most worthless, look here, well, you might not do nothing for them, baby, but you, you get mad as hell if you find out that your, that their mother is teaching them to call some other man daddy. You ain't gave them a quarter since 02. But boy, you just see them calling another man daddy. You, what, what, what you talking about? That's my baby. I mean, that's any father. Then I have a rotten father feel that way. You know the best father's going to feel that way. All right, all right to be known but he had a purpose in hiding his identity for a period of time yes, sir. because there was a special work that had to be done come on, come on. Come on. that could not be done in the presence of God and the knowledge of him to all the people right. and it happened 6,000 years ago right. 6,000 years ago there was a man made come on. Come on. to rule and he was told to multiply and replenish the earth and to conquer and subdue it. But all you have to do is read that over again. And it tell you that's not talking about the original man of the earth. Look what God says, multiply and replenish. The word, word replenish comes from the Latin word plenare. Plenare means to fill. Re is a prefix which means again. You can't do something again that you ain't done already. To refill means to fill something that's already full. So he said that they were to replenish the earth, repopulate the earth, displace people in the earth with their own people, subdue and conquer the original man. This man whose job it was to do this, man named Yaqub. You'll find his name, you'll find Jews in Israel right now with his name. You'll find Muslims with derivation, Yaqubu, Yaqubah, right? The Hebrew name, Yaqub, translated in the Bible as Jacob. And if you study Jacob very carefully in the Bible, you'll see that it tells the same story. Said that Jacob wrestled with an angel till the break of day, right? He said, I'm not going to turn you loose till you bless me. He said, He touched the hollow of his thigh and threw it out of joint. And you and I sit up in Sunday school and teach the little children that, you know, his hip was thrown out of joint and so forth. No, the hip ain't the hollow of your thigh. Hollow means an opening. The hollow of your thigh is that opening in between your thighs where your genitals, where your reproductive organs are. And to throw that out of joint means he tampered with the genes of the original man. He wrestled with him until the break of day. What happens at daybreak? Light comes out of darkness, doesn't it? So he wrestled until he could get a white people out of the black people. That's all that was on the earth at the time. Now, in order to get some people to do this work, this man, Yaku, had to use persuasion. That's right. He didn't have an army, he couldn't force nobody. <laughs> so he had to use great wisdom and persuade the people to cooperate with him in this venture. So in getting his followers together, he began to teach them, challenge those other people That's right. on their religion. That's right. Challenge them on their God. Mm -hmm. Yaqub knew the religion of Islam. Mm -hmm. Yaqub knew that the creator 
the original creator of the universe, was dead. Do you hear me talking to you? Don't panic. No lightning bolts gonna come in here unless we throw. Come on now. He knew that the original creator was no longer in existence. So he had, he taught his people to challenge these people to produce the creator, knowing they could not do it. And when his people saw that they could throw a challenge like that and the people couldn't answer it, then they believed in Yahoo. That's right. And they would follow him and do anything that he wanted done. Yes, sir. Praise you to Allah. Yes, sir. As we say, brothers and sisters, that one that created everything, including himself, died like everything that is created, like everything alive died. God is not dead. We're, hold on to your feet. Really. <laughs> and look, imagine how shook up these people were when Yaqub's followers in front of them all right, so your God created heaven and earth. What's he done lately? Where is he? That's right. He said, well, we just believe it. We just got to have faith. That will never stand up in an intelligent mind. Now, I don't mean to insult nobody, but that kind of reasoning will not stand up in an intelligent mind. In order for that kind of reasoning to stick in your mind, your mind first has to be destroyed. And once your mind is destroyed, then somebody can teach you that nothing but faith, I just believe. Come on, brother. Come on, brother. You know, it reminds me, and I'm sorry the radio audience is about to leave us, we haven't really got into the mystery guys yet. But you know that just believe and everything on faith and all that stuff reminded of a good Christian science joke I heard years ago. He said that a friend met a friend of his who had, he hadn't seen in years and he didn't know he had turned Christian scientist. So he, his friend, his Christian science friend asked him, well, how's your father? He said, oh, he's real sick. He said, oh, no, no, he's not sick says, Mrs. Mary Baker Eddy teaches us there's no sensation in flesh. It's all in his mind. He's not sick. He just thinks he's sick. He said, oh, okay. <laughs> so he left. So about a month later, they ran to each other again, and in their conversation, the guy says, oh, by the way, how's your father? He said, oh, that fool, now he thinks he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> challenge the people those with intelligent minds didn't try to defend that that was indefensible so they began to soften up and listen to Yaku and he began to get followers he got so many followers when they, they they arrested him and his followers they filled up the jails and they still had more preaching on the street than they had in the jail <laughs> but we're not going through that whole story you'll have to stick around and study with us to get that but founded a whole new civilization by challenging the people on the God, on the true God, and then leading them to a spook God. Today, those of us who are backing, following, and helping Minister Farrakhan are being led by him to stand on the foundation of the true God and to challenge who is that mystery God. Come on. Yes, sir. Now, we want you to understand, especially our good black Christian brothers and sisters, we're not just after you. We're not just after the Trinity, Father, Son, and that ghost. <laughs> or as that, he, as that hippie said, Big Daddy, Junior, and the Spook. <laughs> we, we, we're not after them, just after them. Those people who believe in snakes, we're after them. Those Hindus, Brahmins as they call them, who are so ignorant, their babies will be dying for lack of milk, and they got a cow out there talking about that's God we can't milk it. We after him. We after them spooky Muslims who every time you say Allah, they point and say, Allah, Allah. We after them too. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Now, I remember years ago, one of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's first followers to go on Hajj came back from Mecca and said, Dear Apostle, you know, uh, I went over there, you, you know, you taught us that Mecca was such a clean city and taught us that people were so honest that if you lost your 
wallet or something, they had holes in the wall, you go back, somebody will have picked it up and stuck it up and won't even have taken the money out. And said, you know, you just told me all sorts of things. He said, I got over there and the streets are filthy. He said, they got cow, I mean, uh, camel chips all on the ground. Can't hardly walk for them, you know. And say, hey, folks are ripping each other off, you know, picking pockets and stuff. Now I'll be like to mom, mom said, brother, that's not the mecca I'm teaching you about. All right. Isn't that that? <laughs> then our lessons when you talk about, you know, your reward is you get a free trip to Mecca to visit Brother Muhammad and all that. He ain't talking about that Mecca and he ain't talking about that Muhammad. <laughs> if you listen to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's series, Theology of Time, listen to how he says, we're not going to fight a people for that old corrupt city. That's right. With those white scientists. Yeah. Old scientists over in Mecca white now. He said, no, we're not going to submit to any white people anymore, no matter what they are and who they claim to be. He said, we're going to build a new Mecca with black scientists as it was in the beginning. Now, we hear some of our people, well then, wait a minute. Then why then is Minister Farrakhan moving us closer to them? Why are we engaging in some of their practices more? also is moving us closer to the Christians of our people. That's right. He's in, he's been in the church, there was a time when he was spending as much time in the church as he was spending in the mosque. Right. Right. You see him embracing and aiding the Hebrew Israelites. They, they make the difference which direction they're going, we got to get them all. That's right. The Hebrews, the Christians, and the Muslims have got to understand. When God says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, Hebrews, Jews, and all the rest of y'all, that means Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Christians, Il Papa can travel all over here trying to make friends. Rome is going to be destroyed. Mecca in Saudi Arabia is going to be destroyed because ain't none of them fit to be called a holy nation. It talks about four and twenty elders. 24 people that we're familiar with in Islam. We know, know them as the 24 scientists who write the history in advance. The ones who write the scriptures and take them out and give them to the people that we have always called prophets. The four and 20 elders, the 12 majors and 12 minors. The 12 major scientists are the 12 who always have the secret of God within them. They're the ones who always have known who he is. But now, it says in the book of Revelation, God sitting on the throne with a book. Got his elders standing there now. They're all struck by the book. Who can open the seals on the book? Don't none of them volunteer. But they said a the little lamb walks up. He didn't say, may I have the book, sir? Took the book. That's right, brother. Give it here. I was looking, I thought the next line they were going to say he slapped somebody or something. I mean, he <laughs> said the lamb took the book, ate the book, and started spitting it out. <laughs> and what did the elders do? Said they took off their crowns, didn't they? Yes. Now, if they had crowns, what's that telling you? They were in rulership. Yes. Took off their crowns. Now, to show you how heavy the lamb was. They didn't take their crown and put them on his head. They knew the crowns they wore on their heads weren't worthy to touch his head. They put their crowns at his feet. Yeah. <laughs> That's how bad that man was. Yes, sir. Book said he looked as if he had been slain from the foundation of the world. Hadn't been slain, but looked as if he had been slain. Right as he was at the foundation upon which a whole new world was being built, it looked as if he was dead in 1975, but you see him coming back into rulership. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hone in on this, brothers and sisters. Fellow Muslims, first surah of the Holy Quran spends the whole first eight chapters mm -hmm. convincing us that revelation can only come from a man. 
Revelation can only come from a man. All right. How did Moses get his revelation? Said Moses got his revelation by talking to God face to face as a man talks to his friend. That's right. If Moses got revelation from God, and revelation can only come from God, is one plus one two? What does that make God? <laughs> all right. I mean, let's just use like the Bible says, prove all things. Come on. Hold fast to that which you mean. It didn't say believe nothing without proof. It said prove all things. Right. Hold fast to that which is good. <clears throat> now, you always pictured a man in your head when you thought of God. Yes, you did. The time you prayed, you got something in your head. I know what it was, but... <laughs> Yeah, you had that hippie picture you, some of you got hanging on your wall. <laughs> the quiet, holy looking thing. Looking like he just stepped off the plane from San Francisco. See, I got worried when they start calling him Sweet Jesus. I knew I didn't want to swap follow the dude. <laughs> <laughs> and that got me right there, Jack. Not the kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, the Bible and the Holy Quran. Say that God sees, which requires eyes. That's right. Say he hears, which requires ears. Say he feels, which requires a nervous system. Say he sits on a throne. <laughs> I mean, let's be for real. <laughs> According to the Hadith, the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, one day he and his followers were sitting, or his companions were sitting around talking about the, the fundamental principles of Islam, the first of which is belief in Allah. And as they were discussing, you must believe in Allah, they said, Muhammad said, you must not only believe in Allah, but you must believe in the meeting with Allah. You don't hear too many so-called Orthodox Muslims talk about that hadith. In fact, there's a whole lot of hadith they don't talk about. They pick and choose. That's right. You know, selective worship. <laughs> we mean believe in the meeting with Allah. If Allah is a spirit, you might have already met him. You wouldn't have no way of knowing. I mean, just look at it. I mean, this is, this is, you know, our whole concept has just been messed up. It doesn't fit in with reality. That's why you got this big battle going on, been going on for years between science and religion. True science has no battle with religion because science means knowledge and God is the best knower. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible says Enoch walked with God. He walked with a spirit. Spirit can't walk, no feet. <laughs> Moses didn't talk to no God in no bush. He said, like a friend. You know, you'd get awful suspicious if every time you went to see your friend, he'd hide behind a bush. <laughs> hey, I want to check this dude. You, you go keep it around that bush. Let me see what mocking brothers and sisters, but you know, sometimes you think about it, it gets pretty funny. According to the Bible, now I'm not going to tell you exactly where, because you're lazy. You go right there and wouldn't read nothing else, but I'll tell you the book is, and you just read the whole book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, they got God eating veal chops and cornbread. Now see, the minute I saw that, <laughs> now with the veal chops, it might have been all right to say God was a white man, but when they said cornbread, I knew that was jazz. <laughs> yeah. Say that's what Abraham fed him. Veal, corn cakes. Which is the way we like them best, wasn't it, brother? In the oven was all right, but we like to put them on the, on, in the skillet. Yes, they fed him corn cakes. I know he was from home, too. But check this out. You know, we've, we've said, we've taught this, and people have come back to us and said, well, you know, 
it doesn't say in the book that that was God that he was feeding. Come on, use your brain. It said that these three men came walking toward Abraham's tent out in the plain. And when Abraham saw them approaching, said he ran and he knelt down in front of one of them and called him Lord. Yeah. The Bible says Abraham was a friend of God. You don't mistake your friend. He's a friend of God. How is he going to mistake somebody else for God? He didn't have to go and say, now let me see, which one? Eeny, meeny, might be, maybe Mo is God. He didn't go through that. He went right to the one he knew and said, Lord, fell down on his knee. That's right. Said, Lord, you look hungry. Let me fix you something to eat. Say, now I can have my wife to kill the, the, the young uh, cow, the young calf. Say, and then I can have her. And he was talking so long, God said, hey, do as thou hast said. God's mouth watering. This guy's sitting there talking. <laughs> This thing is real. Everybody said, but say, God, don't go do as thou hast said. Don't talk, man. Move. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah. So while Sarah was getting the food ready, check how real God is. You know, Abraham had walked up and knelt in front of him, got close to his feet, you know, and embraced him and all that. Abraham said, God, you want a little water? Want to wash up a little bit for dinner? See? God, he said, you know, you look kind of tired. He didn't tell him you probably smell kind of tired too, you know. He said, you want some water? Yeah, got some water. You don't need no water for a spook now. A spook don't sweat, don't, have no, don't need no deodorant, nothing. You understand? But he had to go wash God's hands and feet and face and stuff off before he ate dinner. For that. I think you get the picture. Read it for yourself. You think we're making it up? Read it for yourself. Now, God, according to all of the teaching that we have gotten, is coming to destroy this wicked world. Now, that, that's the part that is true. <laughs> but now, you and I have always been taught these fire and brimstone stories that we could just see the whole earth going up in flames. Yeah, God's going. God's going. Destroy all, everybody, especially as the Bible says that there are none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, you know, when they say God going to destroy the wicked and going to destroy the world, we see all of it going. Ain't no hope. That's why some of the folks get out there and boogie. Oh, man, ain't no sense. Man. He ain't going to take it away anyway. He might as well get on out of here. <laughs> but see, what you got to understand is the Bible was not written in English. The people back there didn't speak English. And even the New Testament, though it was not written, at least we don't have the versions of it written in the language that Jesus and Paul and all the disciples spoke. The oldest transcript that they have that they still are using to translate is Greek. And in the Greek language, that word that's used as world about the destruction is cosmos. And the word cosmos is a Greek word for system. System. There is a wicked system. That God, that's why you have different, you have the sports world, the entertainment world, the political world. Those are systems. That's right. All right. Just wanted to clear that up so everybody won't think that we all going somewhere. There. The Bible says generations come, generations go, but the earth abides forever. God ain't going to destroy everything. He's going to destroy what won't act right. <laughs> one that's coming for the destruction, for the judgment and the destruction, is constantly referred to from the Old Testament all the way into the New Testament as the Son of Man. And that's a strange title. Why do they pick that title? Since we're all sons of men. Now, we get called sons of everything, but we're all sons of men. <laughs> but now we're also sons of women. You know, why single that out? Somehow they're trying to make a distinction between this man's mother and his father. To keep on emphasizing that he's the son of man. And if you say, yeah, that's Jesus coming back. Wait a minute. According to the teachings of the church, Jesus was not the son of a man. He was only the son of a woman. The, 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 the Christian church teaches that Jesus did not even have a man forefather, so he's the son of a woman. He's not the son of a man. 
Make it play. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll get to it. We're not going to leave you out there. <laughs> Jesus said himself that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, check this out now, they are the sons of God. It's the first thing. See, you get the son of man, they call Jesus the son of God and all of that, and the only begotten son of God, we want to kill that off. Jesus said that as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Remember when Noah's people were destroyed in the flood? Why were they destroyed? The book says because the sons of God start marrying the daughters of men. So where you get this only begotten son? This way back in Genesis, talking about sons of God. Okay. All right. Jesus says again. Now, if you say God is a spirit, Jesus is the Son of God, He'd have to be a spirit too. Because to quote Jesus, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. All right. Now, Jesus is called the Son of David. Also. And he's called the Son of God. Now all you have to do is turn to the book of Romans, the first chapter, mm -hmm. the 34th verse. Mm -hmm. Paul clears it up so beautifully. He says, Jesus was born the Son of David in the flesh, declared to be the Son of God in the Spirit. So that's all of us. God is our spiritual Father. We also got a flesh father or we wouldn't be here. Right. Jesus was no different in that respect. That's right. <laughs> when Matthew runs down Jesus' genealogy to show that he is the son of David, Mary was not related to David. Right. Joseph descended from David's lineage. <laughs> So if Jesus, if Joseph were not Jesus' father, Jesus could not be the son of David. I mean, the proof is there. It tells you prove all things. <laughs> so it was through his father that he was linked. All the way back to Abraham, 42 generations. When Matthew started with the genealogy of Jesus, he started with Abraham and went 42 generations to Jesus. Interesting figure. In the Holy Quran, Allah starts off saying, I, Allah, am the best knower. And then many times in the Holy Quran, you see Allah saying, I. But in many other places, you see him saying, and we did this. Surely we revealed to you as we revealed to Noah and Moses and Abraham and Jacob and the tribes. We did this. I is God. And we is God. One's first person singular, one's first person plural. What's the difference? Why, what is this? Why is that in there? Well, you know what? Those are personal pronouns, right? Yes, sir. Personal. A pronoun refers to a person, place, or thing. A personal pronoun refers to a person. <laughs> Defense rest. Okay. <laughs> so what is Allah saying when he keeps saying, I did this and I'm going to do this and we doing this? He is saying, I, the representative of a divine family, am here to tell you some of the things we have done down through the ages. But now I'm here, and since we have done this and got to this point, now here's what I'm going to do. Because whatever all the rest of them knew, how much wisdom they had, none of them have what I have because I am the best knower. God has evolved from his original creation through superior beings to the supreme being. I'm going to go through that again. <laughs> let's, let's back up a little bit though. I said God evolved. That's because he did not create himself perfect. Had he
he been a perfect creation, his creation would have been perfect. But he doesn't create anything in his perfected state. He creates everything in a state that it has to develop to perfection. You've never seen an oak tree just come up an oak tree. It's a little acorn. And it has to be treated right, and then it grows into an oak tree. The same with you and I. The same with the animals out there. Had he been perfect, then he would have had a perfect creation. When did he create himself? Well, we can't say exactly. We got an idea when the atoms started rotating to cause him to build himself into man. But we don't have the exact time. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says in our lessons that the nation of Islam has no beginning nor ending. In the Bible, they have a name, Melchizedek, whom they say has no beginning, no ending, no mother, no father, has neither beginning of time nor end of day. You know it's not talking about an individual, if so, where is Melchizedek now? It's not talking about an individual. It's talking about a people known yes, as Melchizedek. And that's us. Yes, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that actually the black man had a beginning. If you want to be real technical, he said the black man had a beginning. But it was so long ago, time itself has erased it. That's when we say have no beginning. Once you erase something, it's not there anymore. Time erased the beginning of the black man. Praise is due to Allah. Now, the first God, as we said, died. Well, how can we say God is not dead? Because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that that God, that creator, the person of God, continued right up to today in his people. Now you can understand that. If you could trace your ancestry back a billion years, you would find somebody back there that produced somebody that produced that they got all the way to you. And part of what you are today and how you are today was contained right in that progenitor. Right in that ancestor, there were certain characteristics that determine how you look, how you act, and a bunch of other things about you that have come down a billion years because you are still carrying the gene of that ancient ancestor. All right. So, as the creation continues, as we mentioned, each god ruled until a superior one was born. Whenever one was born whose knowledge was superior to the one whose knowledge was ruling then, then he took over and began to rule. And even after he was physically dead, his knowledge would rule until a superior knowledge came. This is why, you know, people have been saying all these hundreds of thousands of years, yes, I'm worshiping the supreme being, but you're worshiping somebody who wasn't there. Somebody who wasn't even in existence yet. That's why they always taught us of what? The coming of God. They always told us the coming of God would be the end of the wicked and the establishment of his kingdom. Well, if God is everywhere, as we were taught, where is he coming from? I mean, let's go to kindergarten, brothers and sisters. Never mind all this college stuff. Let's just get right on down to the nitty gritty. If he's everywhere, where can he come from and where can he go? <laughs> they were talking about the coming of the supreme being. Because each one was superior until you get to the last one. Yeah. The word superior is a comparative tense. Supreme is the superlative. That means you can't go no further. All right. <laughs> There's not a, a succession of supreme beings that have come along. There have been superior beings until one day in the end there came that supreme being. Come on knowledge was so great it encompassed the whole 360 degrees of the circle of knowledge that means that no other knowledge will ever come that's superior to it so he's called the everlasting God that's why they make a distinction they call him the ever if he was the only God ever existed they wouldn't have to have any adjectives they use everlasting to distinguish him from those temporary gods that's why he has the power to say, I will make a new heaven and a new earth. You know why? 
because he studied 42 years. That's what that 42 generations in the Bible is talking about. He studied 42 years. He said, what? God had to study? That's right. <laughs> Otherwise, he'd be a Negro. <laughs> Study 42 years. He was a specially prepared man, but he had to study. Then his father paid oh millions of dollars out for books for him to study. Traveled all over the world. Went secretly to universities right here in America. People didn't even know who he was. Now, in his study, he's the first one to ever learn the secret of how the universe was created. And you know anything, you, once you learn how to do something, you may have never done it before, but you can do it then. That right, Sister G, you ain't never baked something before. Give you a recipe, you will do that bad boy. Might even improve on it, huh? Especially if you've been tasting one and you knew there was something missing. When you make yours, you're going to put in it what it needs. <laughs> now, look at this son of man. I want to let you know about that term before we leave here today. Why is he called the son of man? Jesus in the Bible, whose genealogy is run down, shows his genealogy going through his father back to Abraham. And Jesus was raised up for the salvation of the seed of Abraham. That's right. Now, it doesn't tell us who Mary's people were, but Jesus didn't come to save Mary's people. He came to save his father's people. Now, Master Farad Muhammad's father was black, yeah. and his mother is a Caucasian. He came to save his father's people. He didn't come to save his mother's people. That's why he's called the Son of Man. Yes. <laughs> Praise is due to Allah. Isaiah talks about how our seed would come from the east and gather us from the west. He didn't say a friend. He said, your seed, your flesh and blood. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad describes us as the last members of a chosen people. The last members, not some of the last members. He said, we, the black people here in North America, that came off the slave block, are the last members of a chosen people. We are the only members and immediate of, of Master Farad Muhammad's immediate family, understand this, the only direct descendants of the Creator Himself. Now, I, you, you just wrestle with that because this is not the end of this subject, it's the end for the day. <laughs> but understand this, we are the only direct descendants. Everybody else has been mixed up, cut off, and pushed to... This is why we're a whole new people. But we're the only ones carrying the bloodline all the way from the creator of the universe. We love our brothers overseas and all them other lands, but they ain't us. They don't have, they're not members of the immediate family. Okay, there's a difference. Now, I just want to say to you, in the, those of you who are indulging in the study with us on Friday night, keep it up, whatever you do, because this is just a prelude. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving a lot, of, I know you, you know, there's some stuff boom, running around in your brain today, like you got a racetrack in there. And, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to stay here till we unravel it. That needs to be done in a different manner. That's right. It needs to be done with you taking what you've got and what else you will get and sitting down. And as rational human beings, you wrestle it out. That's right. That's right. You begin to struggle with it. Then you got it. Right. Somebody just stand up and preach to you, you get a certain amount of it. But when you sit down and wrestle and do your own research and do your own study and do your own reasoning, that's when you really got it indelibly stamped in your brain. Yeah. So Minister Farrakhan is in the process now of devising some of the future study guides to deal with who is that mystery guy. Oh. This is why it was under his instruction that I taught this subject today.
told me last week to be sure and teach this subject today, to prime you, get you ready for what's coming. So you know it's got to be powerful if you couldn't have faced it head on without first getting a little prime. <laughs> Praise is due to Allah. But, brothers and sisters, I just, I want to keep in your mind, I want to keep in your mind this direct bloodline. Because this is the key. If you go back through the study guides we already have, 1 through 11, and begin to see what Minister Farrakhan is saying to us, you will see that direct bloodline plays a key part in what we're able to do. The reason he's telling us we're able to reach within us and get certain things, because he knows it's in us. Yes. You go back and look at those study guides again in light of what we've talked about today, and you'll see something different. All right? Now, this is why there are wise scholars who are angry at Minister Farrakhan, who are jealous of us. Because this teaching, now that they have studied it for so many years, over 50 years they've been studying it, and they finally have come to the realization that this teaching is not designed to make us like the Jews were when they ruled, like the Arabs were when they got on top, like these Caucasians. No. This teaching is going to make us I mean, the run in the middle of it, just, just the rank and file of us, each one of us, the least of us, yes, sir. will be greater than any prophet that ever came. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But fasten your seatbelts. Yes, sir. We will be greater than all of the gods who existed before Master Farad Muhammad. Every god that has ruled this universe up to now, we are going to be a people greater than any of them. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that's a powerful promise. <laughs> but if you get in it, stick with it, you'll see it develop. You'll wonder, why didn't I see that before? This seems so obvious to me now. Yeah, it seems mysterious to you today. But you stick with it, and that's why you say, my God, I should have known that all the time. <laughs> you know? Now, one of the things that I know I better clear up with you, so you won't have to swallow all the excedrin in the drugstore. <laughs> we talk about the flesh and blood of every God that has ruled dying. Yet we say God is not dead. I know that's hard to grasp when it hits you in the face, but think about it, study on it, wrestle with it. You know, one of the things that made some of the Muslims declare that we were guilty of shirk, making companions, worshiping others besides Allah and all that sort of stuff. But because they had a misconception of that. Mm -hmm. But when Minister Farrakhan traveled over there, got with the scholars, wrote Master Farah Muhammad's name on the board, and then broke down to them the genealogy of God himself, they fell back. They bore witness and let him alone and then asked what could they do to help. <laughs> because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad phrased what he said very accurately. He said, Allah came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. He said, Master Farad Muhammad is God person. All right. Back to your dictionary. You're in for a real shock. <laughs> Go back into your, I mean a big dick, don't get them pocket things. They need to put them out of business. <laughs> pocket things don't get you in nothing but trouble. <laughs> if possible, go to the library and look in the Oxford English Dictionary. Yes. That's the book of the English language. Look up the word person. That's right. Read the history, the etymology of person. And you'll find that it's only been recently that the word person was used to describe a human being. When you look at the meaning, the original meaning of person, you'll see mask, M-A-S-K, mask. Because a few hundred years ago, during the Elizabethan era, back when Shakespeare and Marley and Bacon and all them were writing, when actors came on stage, they always had a mask in front of them of that which they were trying to portray. They were all English. So if they were playing an Italian, they came out with an Italian man. All right. If they were playing a Chinese, they came out with an Italian man. Well, the name of that theatrical mask was a person. A person. 
that was used to hide the true identity so that they would appear to be what they're trying to demonstrate to the audience. And that's, what a, that's where the word person comes from. It means a man which hides the identity. So therefore, if you didn't know that that was a mask, a Chinese mask, you walk up to an Englishman and start speaking Chinese. Because you have gotten so geared into the person till you don't see the reality behind the person. You think the person is the reality, the person is the mask for the reality. Allah came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. due to Allah. Is it still a mystery? <laughs> Praises be to Allah. That was uh, some lecture, brothers and sisters. We certainly didn't waste our time this Sunday coming out to the final call. We feasted well on God's word. And I told you you would be in for something brother's been teaching for a number of years and we're blessed to have him here in Chicago with us you're blessed to have him here to impart this to us and to give us some of those years of experience and not so much just that but even in this hour he is getting things because he's not stopped studying you know you can tell when a man speaks to you like that he's not just talking off the top of his head that comes that comes from years of systematic discipline and study and that's something that we have to get more into we have to get more into reading being selective about what we put into our brain you know in the meaning of the FOI it talks about uh, strategies of moving and tactics of moving and establishing beachheads behind enemy territory but see we take that to the spiritual dimension we got to fight on a spiritual level our mind is is our enemy because we've given it so much garbage now it can't even be a real friend to us that's why it always uh the, the lessons say you know we're easily led in the in the wrong direction hard to lead in the right direction there's a reason for that there's a blueprint there but um when we get into solving who is the mystery God, we'll unravel all mysteries in that. So praises be to Allah for brother giving us that. And I, I hate to think there's another part coming to this. I mean, he didn't even finish today. He had to cut it off. He doesn't, but remember what he said. Read and study and drink some of this in for yourself and start unraveling these things yourself. Because when I came in, I came in as a doubter, see, and I was going to disprove a lot of things. So in my attempt to disprove the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I became a believer in those teachings because I found him to be absolutely correct in everything that he taught. Because I spent many days in my first uh, six months in the Nation of Islam in the library. I took how to eat to live apart. I took everything I could and tried to see if I could find some information, some body of knowledge that would contradict what the Honorable Boy Elijah Muhammad had taught. But as I said before, and all praises due to Allah, I found him to be absolutely correct. I heard Brother Collin say that he had done some, somewhat of the same thing, and it made him a faithful follower of the Honorable Boy Elijah Muhammad for a number of years, for about 20 years now. That brother's been preaching in the wilderness of North America. Now, I understand he's doing a fantastic job in the South rocking and shaking the South down there in Atlanta. And I think the minister, uh, Farrakhan, will be back with us in a few more days, brothers and sisters, but we, we follow the truth, isn't that right? So it doesn't make any difference who's here as long as they're preaching the truth. They're not mixing it, they're not taking away from it and adding to it. We're, we're going to come out and support that person, isn't that right? All praise is due to Allah. I'd like to ask a very important question. How many of you are here for your first, second, or third time today? Can I see that by a show of hands? Thank you, thank you.
Let me ask another question. How many of you that are here for your first, second, or third time feel that what you heard today is the truth and it is good for black people? What you heard today. All praise is each other. One more very, very important question. Of those of you who feel that what you heard today is the truth and is good for black people, we're not in the habit of asking you to join anything because you can't join something that you were already born. We're all born Muslims and we're Muslims by nature, meaning we are already genetically coded to submit to the will of God. All we got to do is hear the right word and we're ready to go. So all a person has to do is be black and ready and be willing to study. There are no sheep here, we are making shepherds. All praise is due to Allah for the work that Minister Louis Farrakhan is doing with black people in America today. So if he's not interested in sheep, he's interested in shepherds, that means that we want to know who is willing to make a commitment to study, to study into this teaching, not just jump into it, but to come out with us on Friday nights and learn more about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his teaching, and the work that Minister Louis Farrakhan is doing as a result of that teaching. May I see a show of hands of those that are willing to take another step and come out and study with us and learn more about this teaching. Who's willing this time come up and see us today? All praise is before you. Now I notice everyone didn't raise their hands even though they felt it was good for black people. If you're a little shy, you can uh, see the secretary on the second floor. But those people that raised your hands, I would like the opportunity to, of having the privilege and the honor of shaking your hand on behalf of Minister Louis Farrakhan. I would ask you then to see our dear brother Sabir Muhammad, who is over here on the wall, and he will take you and give you some more information on uh, the further steps that you can take in coming in to study this magnificent teaching and study the majesty of these great men that are working in our midst today. If you would just kindly come down this aisle, I'd like the opportunity to shake your hand. All of, all of those that raised their hand and said that you're willing to come out and study with us, would you please just come right up to the podium here so we can shake your hand? know who's in that line going into that West Hall. You never know. One day I was in the line and I uh, see other brothers that are working in the wilderness of North America and I can remember the day that they stood up. And uh, it could be another Malcolm X on the other side of that room just waiting to drink this in and get out and do the work. I mean when he had sense and he was in line with his leader and teacher. All praise is due to Allah. At this time brothers and sisters we want to have our love offering our public uh, charity collection. If the brothers and sisters could come right on up and uh, dig deep, brothers and sisters, whatever you can do to help us. We don't have Title 20 funding us and, you know, the government decided they're not going to help us out. So since they made that decision, we're on our own. We got to do it all by ourselves. So treat the charity collection like that. And, if it's going to get done, it's going to get done by us. Whatever get done for us will be done by us.